Hi, my name is Emily Anxler, and I have professional soccer player here, Leah Fola, and we'll be talking about the U.S. women's soccer team fight for equal pay. So, Leah, how do you feel about the United States women's soccer team in regards to their lawsuit to close the pay gap between men and women? Uh, I feel that they're within every, every right of their own to, to, for, to file the lawsuit. I think that if, that if the, pay, the pay is different in terms of their revenue, if they both bring in the same money and they're paid differently, then they have then they should be paid equally or vice versa. If one's paid more, if one brings in more revenue than the other, then one should be paid more than the other. And I think that if they have to, to file a lawsuit to achieve their goals and they think they're in their, they think they're right to, then I think more power to them. Do you believe the lawsuit is necessary for these women to achieve their goal? Um, I think in part it is necessary for them to achieve their goal. I think to me what speaks the loudest would be, would be their success. So since they won the last two World Cups, I think that speaks louder than any lawsuit. So for example, had they done poorly in the past two World Cups and not, and then filed a lawsuit, people would have started to ask questions like, well, are they deserving of, of the pay the men are making if they're not making as much money or generating as much revenue? But seeing how they are super successful, far more successful than the men's World Cup in terms of you know, one of the women's feet national, uh, you know, competitions. I think that the lawsuit isn't kind of necessary, but I think the success that preceded it is even more important. But in the, yet again, they did, they did file a lawsuit before they even won the World Cup. So I think that they felt that it is necessary in order for them to achieve their goal. Since the women's team just won the World Cup yet again, will this play a factor in them being successful in their fight to equality? Yeah, I think 100%. Um, they won, what was it, 2015? Yeah. Four years ago, they won, they won the 2015 World Cup. They won this World Cup, which is 2019. And they've been, they've been number one or top three in the world for the past, who knows, two decades maybe. They've always been in the conversation of the best teams in the world in the women's game. And if they're, if, if they keep running and running and running and the men, the men didn't even qualify for the men's World Cup last, last year, 2018. So if you have one team that's running a World Cup and one that's not even qualifying, I think I think you have to take a you have to take a look deep look at the, the wage structure and how each team is being paid and you know and and, the, and like I said the, the revenue they generate and if the women's team bring a lot more revenue then because they won the World Cup which I would imagine they they are since the men's team even make it then I think it's a huge factor in them being successful for their fights with quality. If the women would have never won any World Cups. But they were still having decent seasons and bringing in enough revenue that made more than the men's. Do you still think they should get more pay? Yeah, 100%. I think, unfortunately, in, in the United States, I don't know, in a lot of the other world, I mean, sports is a business, obviously, but um, especially in the States, it's, it's all about the money you bring in. So if you have a player like Alex Morgan, who's not just a soccer player, she's more than a soccer player. You know, she represents, you know, she has all this money in advertising and commercials and magazine shoots, you know, so if they, if they manage to get millions of people turning on the TV to watch their, to watch their game, even though they hadn't won that much and they brought in more money than the men, then hey, they gotta be paid equally. And I think you could see that in other fields, like such as models, female models make more than male models, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's just, that's just the reality is because they bring in more money, they bring in more advertising, they bring in more attention, so they deserve to get paid more. Would the team be filing a lawsuit if they did not win the U.S. World Cup? Um, I, if they filed, if they filed, if they filed if I'm not mistaken, they filed a lawsuit before they won the World Cup, but um, they had also won the World Cup in 2015. Mm. And especially since the men didn't qualify for the World Cup last year, I think when they look at the generate the revenue generated in this last FICO, which I don't know what it is, the past two or three years, I would assume that the women produced generated more money because just the fact that the men missed out on the World Cup, if you miss out on the World Cup, as the men's team, you're missing out on so much money because the amount of money that the men's World Cup generate is huge. And the fact that they missed out on it, they just, they must, they must have had a, a weak year in 2018 in terms of, in terms of revenue generated. And um, this year, they actually had a tournament themselves. The final is actually the same day as the Women's World Cup. It's called the Gold Cup. It's like the North American Cup. So you have the World Cup, and then you have cups for each continent. So you have, like, a European Cup, 
of European national teams and the you know South American Cup, which is called Copa America. But um, the men actually made it to the final, but then they lost in Mexico. So they couldn't even run their Continental Cup, let alone the World Cup. So it's just it's funny to see. Yeah. Do you think they're overstepping any boundaries with the U.S. soccer organization and their partnership with them by filing this lawsuit? Um, like I said, if they, I think U.S. soccer and both men and women team know better than anyone. But if they feel they're in the right, which I think they are, then I don't think they're overstepping any boundaries. The, the U.S. Soccer Federation, which is in charge of both the men and women team, I've read a couple quotes they said in regards to the lawsuit. They said that the... So the women bring in more fans in the past couple of years, I think, to their national team games. So in terms of ticket sales, they, they generated a little bit more for the men. But the soccer federation claims that revenue generated is not just by tickets, it's by advertisements as well. And then they also claim that the advertisements sold, so for example, I think, if you have a sponsor of the national team, it's like, uh, you have like, let's say Gatorade, for example, right? You can't just buy the men's advertising rights, you have to buy the men and women's advertising rights together. So that's what they were stating. So I think it's for them they're trying to say that's so it's difficult to see who brings in more money. But I like I said, I would imagine that this past well, this past year the women's gotten far more money or not far more money, but at least far more attention and generated more revenue than than the men's did. Being a male athlete and having people look up to you as a role model, do you believe that this fight is just for women's soccer teams' own personal factors, or it is indeed about breaking barriers in the sexist sports world? I think um it's good to have role models like those three, and maybe even more you can mention. And I would say that uh, there definitely is some sexism in the sports, and there's obviously sexism in the world, but I think a lot of it is, for example, for sports, the majority of people who watch sports are male. I think it's safe to say, right? Yeah. And um, especially like a sport like soccer, or basketball, or football, it's mainly men, and I would imagine, I think, I don't know, I don't speak for every man, but every man not every, but most men would prefer to watch men's sports. So I think the biggest thing there is that, for example, the one the World Cup is only every four years, right? So if people are only watching women's soccer every four years, how can you potentially, how can you possibly ever bring in the money to compare it to the men when you only watch it every four years? One of the reasons why the men's World Cup is so big is because the players that are in the men's World Cup, everyone follows every year with their teams. So if it's like Manchester United or Barcelona, you know, with their club teams. Now, the thing is, women's soccer has, like, on the club level, which is not national teams, you know, it's like the clubs that they play with every year and they actually get paid for. No one really watches those games. Like, if you look at the attendance for the, the I think, NWSL, which is National Women's Soccer League, I'm pretty sure, in the States, which is a professional league. It's called not the WNBA, but for women's soccer, and the attendance is very, very low. You know, it's just, they don't get paid much. And it's be fair, it's because no one goes to these games and no one watches these games. So I think if they want to make it better for generations that come, they need to start by supporting local teams, not just the national team. I think they need to go out to the, the teams that, that are in this NWSL and go out and support them and buy merchandise and, and do all that. Because I don't think it's enough to just every four years, like, oh, you're say want to work out, women's soccer is a great thing. No, it's like, well, you only supporting them every four years. What about the three years in between? Those women saw to go play, and you guys aren't watching, you guys aren't supporting. So I think that's a big part of it. But um, the stars are definitely breaking barriers. And they are changing the conversation a little bit in sports. And I think it's a good thing. Obviously, it can be a bad thing. I think it can bring a lot of negative publicity to stars like, for example, Megan Rapinoe. Is very, she's very outspoken, but she does bring a little bit of negative attention to herself and, and the team. When I think people are judging the team, the women's national team, not only on the success anymore, but on the political part of it, because a lot of them are politically outspoken. When, first and foremost, you judge an athlete by his success, by how great he is, right? You don't judge him by, you judge him by other things, but first and foremost, you judge him how he's on the field and on the court. So, um, but I think what they're doing is good, and like I said, for the younger generations, it's got to be support from all out. You can't just support every four years. It's like kind of, you know, it's not, you're not really in it, you know, so. That's how I feel about that. Being a professional men's soccer player, are your views on this topic biased at all? Um, I I think it's impossible to get around bias, either as a men's fan, men as a man or a professional men's soccer player. But uh, I would try to keep my opinions as as non biased as I can. But there definitely are biases in the fact that 
I grew up watching men's soccer. I, for the most part, watched 90% to 95% men's soccer. I did watch the Women's World Cup final. Um, but for the most part, I don't, I, I'm not gonna lie, I don't watch women's soccer. I watch my favorite teams in men, in men, in the World Cup and in, you know, whatever, FC Barcelona, the big, uh, club team. So I think it's, a, it's, it's impossible to get around the bias, but I, I would definitely try to be as, as, uh, neutral as I can. If the women's team are successful with this lawsuit and do come out with the win, could it be because the U.S. women's national program gave in in order not to be betrayed as sexist or because they really believe that the women deserved better pay and supported it? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that, I don't think, the thing is nowadays a lot of companies and stuff are pressured into doing things just because of the whole like political correctness and they don't want to appear to be sexist or homophobic or racist or whatever. So they just do things even though they may not think it 100% right. I don't think that applies here. I think, like I said, that the men's team is not even qualified for the World Cup last year and the women's team won it. So within these past two years, the money that has been revenue that has been generated, I, I would imagine it's all from, basically all from the women. So if they, if they do get paid more or equally, I think it's because they deserve it, because they're the best team in the world in the past two World Cups. So I don't think they're caving in due to the one who betrayed sex with that. That's not my thing. Can gender discrimination ever be conquered? And is the U.S. women's soccer team sending a message of yes, it can be, by doing all of this? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, that's like, uh, it's a very hard question because we never really know what, how you how would you ever measure if uh, gender discrimination is ever conquered? I think it would be it would be foolish to say that in order to be for gender discrimination to be conquered, woman every woman soccer player needs to get paid at the same as the men, or vice versa. I don't think that makes sense because well, hold on, you can't just pay everyone equally just because they do the same thing, right? Like I'm a professional soccer player, but I don't get paid as much as Cristiano Ronaldo because well, he's Cristiano Ronaldo. It makes sense, but um. As I was saying, the women's side of the team is definitely sending a message that the sport particularly that it can be conquered. And, and the way to, to conquer discrimination or the lack of equal pay is to, to be successful, to draw out fans, to, to pull in advertisers and stuff, which is, which is what the women's World, World Cup team is doing. You see all these stars, Alex Morgan, and then they're all over uh, like talk shows and the news and doing whatever documentaries and stuff. And I think once it gets to the global stage, I think for it to get to the global stage would be a, a big, a big step because yeah, the women's teams here are very successful, but most women teams in soccer are not more successful than the men's teams in terms of money. So let's take France, for example, or where did they play in the final? It was Netherlands. The Netherlands women's team, they made the final. The Netherlands men's team, I don't even think they made the World Cup, but they're very good. They have a lot of superstars on their team. Now, I don't know the specifics of that, but around the world, most, most, the men's team generate far more money than the women's team. It just so happens that the men's team in the USA sucks, partially because they play other sports. They play football, they play basketball, they play baseball. Those are, those are the biggest sports. Then it's soccer for men. You know, for women, I would imagine soccer is probably the biggest, uh, biggest sport for women here. But around the world, soccer is the biggest sport for men. So, the biggest athletes in soccer are all, are a lot, a lot of men, you know, like the Ronaldo's, the Messi, and all that. So, when you look at it at a global level, like FIFA, for example, the World Cup, that they organized the World Cup, the, the revenue generated by the Men's World Cup, last World Cup, was over $6 billion. Over $6 billion. And the Women's World Cup can generate over $130 million. So you have $130 million to $6 billion. You know, so I think there's a big... There's a big step there, but the women's team is in the USA is just setting a great example of how to be a successful team, of how to be consistent, and how to let your you know your your success on the field speak for itself. And then you could you know then you can go out to these things and be like, hey, we brought in more money, we deserve the same pay, or we deserve more. You know, so. Yeah. All right, thank you, Leo.